Saint Jose Sanchez del Rio lived during a dark and often unexamined period in Mexican history. Mexico was embroiled in a nasty internal conflict between the Catholic Church and the state government, the Cristero War. The government controlled the number of priests serving in Mexico, and they even banned priests from celebrating the Mass. The state confiscated the church property and even shot the priests who disobeyed. The faithful tried protesting at first, calmly by peaceful gatherings and prayers. But soon, the conflict escalated, and the movement was named by faithful for Christ the King. The war lasted from 1926 to 1929. Every Mexican became a hero of their faith. Jose Sanchez del Rio was born in the western Mexican state of Michoacan de Ocampo on March 28, 1913. Raised in a strong Catholic environment, Jose was taught well in the faith. Jose was a devout child, especially devoted to Our Lady of Guadalupe. He was active in parish life, and the family prayed the rosary together each day. He went to school in his hometown along with his friends. He was a happy child. The strict laws enforced by the state were taking effect in front of the little boy's eyes. They first banned Catholic education in schools. The church was closed for prayers. Jose could see his friends and neighbors joining the protest. Wanting to defend the faith and rights of Catholics, his older brothers, too, joined the movement. Jose, in greatest desire to defend his faith, sought to join uprising Cristeros. At the age of 13, he asked his mother for permission to join the Cristeros. She objected, telling him that he was too young. Mama, he replied, do not let me lose the opportunity to gain heaven so easily and so soon. After some time, persuaded by his passionate pleadings, she permitted him to join the others among his family. The rebel officers didn't want Jose to join them at first because he was barely 13 years old. However, Jose did not give up his efforts to join, knowing quite well that doing so could cost him his life. Finally, after meeting together with a Cristero officer, allowed him to go in order to be a flag bearer. The boys were given simple auxiliary tasks, such as caring for the horses, cleaning firearms, and water and food service. Despite governmental prohibition of the public practice of religion, Jose attended mass whenever possible received Holy Communion, and never hesitated to proclaim his faith. Jose also proudly carried the banner for the Cristero forces. He was well-liked by the troops, and together they had a daily mass and recitation of the rosary. Jose was placed under the protection of General Luis Guizar Morfin. One day, as they were riding, a sniper's shot killed the general's horse, and he collapsed to the ground. The general was in danger of being captured. Jose, seeing his predicament, quickly got off his horse and handed him to his general. My general, he said, take my horse and save yourself. You are more needed for this cause than I am. At first refusing, the general eventually submitted to Jose's insistence, and by mounting the horse, he was able to safely retreat. But since Jose himself had surrendered his soul to the chance of escape, government troops easily seized him. The anti-Cristero soldiers imprisoned and violently tortured him. This continued for days and weeks, but Jose never gave up. During his imprisonment, he wrote a letter to his mother. Do not be worried about my death, as this would make me suffer. 
be courageous and send me your blessing together with the blessing of my father. Efforts to free him, for example, the intervention of his godfather and the proposal of family ransom by his captors proved unsuccessful. Jose refused all attempts to rescue him, proclaiming, My faith is not for sale. He prayed the rosary daily throughout his imprisonment. One day, in order to terrorize him, soldiers made him watch the hanging of one of the other captured Cristeros. But to their surprise, Jose encouraged the man, asking him to prepare a place for him in heaven. In regards to how Jose received nourishment, food was brought to him inside a small basket. His uncle, Father Ignacio Sanchez, was accustomed to hiding a consecrated host among the various provisions. Upon finding the Eucharist, Jose would kneel in adoration before humbly receiving it and giving thanks. Those passing by the church at this time reported that they could hear Jose reciting the rosary and singing hymns to Our Lady. Even in imprisonment, he never wavered from his life of prayer. He wrote a beautiful letter to his mother, telling her that he was resigned to do God's will. The federal troops continually desecrated the church where they held Jose. Animals were housed there. Food scraps and beer bottles were strewn about. And the altar had been used for firewood. Fighting gamecocks roamed about freely, including on the tabernacle. Indignant at this terrible sacrilege, he seized each of them, thus disposing of the costly birds. Infuriated by the destruction of such valuable animals, the federal authority ordered Jose's death. In one last effort to break his resolve, the soldiers peeled and cut the soles of his feet in order to maximize his sufferings. He was then forced to walk barefoot through the town to the cemetery. He prayed the rosary aloud through this sad spectacle, and a trail of blood followed him from his foot wounds. The soldiers, showing him to his grave, proceeded to tempt him one last time. They told him that he would be free if he would deny Christ at least once. But Jose would never falter. He shouted, Long live Christ the King! Long live Our Lady of Guadalupe! Jose Sanchez del Rio was shot twice, and his martyred body was thrown into an open grave on February 10th, 1928, one month short of his 15th birthday. Saint Jose Sanchez del Rio is proof that sanctity does not require a long life or an early death, only a life, whatever its length, lived with and for the Lord. For young people in today's world, 14-year-old Jose Sanchez del Rio shows them that saints can and do look like them. A miracle was attributed to his intercession in 2008, and on October 16, 2016, Pope Francis canonized Jose Sanchez del Rio a saint. His feast day is February 10th. O Saint Jose, littlest soldier of Christ, whose last bloody steps brought you to the arms of Our Lady and Our Lord. Keep healthy and strong the steps of Our Lord's soldiers who remain here on earth, such that they may have our strength to endure and persevere to the end. Amen. How does a pagan man 
eventually become one of the most important Christians of his time. The story of St. Hilary helps us to see that God can and does work through each one of us. Hilary was born in Portier, France, sometime around the year 300. He was born of heathen parents of an illustrious family and great wealth. Hilary was raised as a pagan. Pagans worshipped many gods. That did not make sense to Hilary. He thought that there could only be one true God. Hilary himself grew up apparently without any significant Christian influence, but received an otherwise comprehensive education in the Latin and Greek classics. He married early in life and had children, including a daughter, St. Abra. All who knew Hilary said he was a friendly, charitable, gentle man. Hillary's studies led him to read scripture. He became convinced that there was only one God whose son became man and died and rose to save all people. This led him to be baptized along with his wife and daughter. He entered holy orders with the consent of his very virtuous wife and separated from his family as was required of the clergy. He later wrote a very famous letter to his dearly loved daughter, encouraging her to adopt a consecrated life. She followed this counsel and died, still young, a holy death. His rise within the church, however, was not gradual at all. Around 353, the people of Portier called for him to be made their bishop. Soon after his consecration, he received a visit from St. Martin of Tours. The young man had recently quit the army seeking God. He quickly became his favorite disciple, and they enjoyed each other's company. At this time, Constantius II had become the sole emperor and he was promoting Arianism. The Arians did not believe in the divinity of Christ, and they claimed Jesus was only human. Powerful forces within both the church and the empire clung to the heresy. Hillary found himself virtually alone in defending Jesus' deity before a hostile crowd of bishops. In 359, he attended the Council of Seleucia, in which Arians, semi-Arians, and Catholics contended for the mastery. The bishops appealed to Emperor Constantius II, who favored a modified version of Arianism and declared Hillary's exile from Gaul. Constantius II did not likely suspect that by banishing Hillary to Phrygia, he would inspire the bishop to mount an even greater defense of orthodox theology. Hillary really had known very little of the whole Arian controversy before he was banished. He learned everything he could about what the Arians said and what the orthodox Christians answered, and then he began to write. There, he wrote his most important work on the Trinity, showing the Bible's consistent witness to the central mystery of Christian faith. Remarkably, this staunchly orthodox bishop also showed great charity toward those he believed were honestly mistaken. Hillary even traveled to Constantinople during his exile to explain to the city's bishops why their emperor was not orthodox. After three years, the emperor kicked him back to Portier because, as we are told by Sulpicius Severus, the emperor was tired of having to deal with the troublemaker, a sower of discord and a disturber of the Orient. But no one told Hillary 
he had to go straight back to his home. And so he took a leisurely route through Greece and Italy, preaching against the Arians as he went. When he was finally permitted to return to Portier, the people gathered in the town square to cheer him. He was not restored to his position as bishop, and he continued to oppose Arianism until his death in 367. In the East, he had also heard the hymns used by Arians and Orthodox Christians as propaganda. These hymns were not based on scripture as Western hymns, but full of beliefs about God. Back at home, Hillary started writing hymns of propaganda himself to spread the faith. His hymns are the first in the West with a known writer. In 360, Hillary cooperated with Martin of Tours in founding the monastery of Lagouge eight kilometers south of Portier, where today the famous abbey of the Benedictine monks of Solome is located. Although in character, Hilary was gentle and courteous, his theological writings show a sharpness of tone against his opponents and are difficult to the point of obscurity. Hillary also composed some of the earliest Latin Christian poems and hymns. Worn out by his travels and struggles, Hillary died in 367. His feast on January 13th marks the start of Hillary term, spring semester at Oxford and Cambridge, and in the law courts. Father, Keep us from vain strife of words. Grant to us constant profession of the truth. Preserve us in a true and undefiled faith, so that we may hold fast to that which we professed when we were baptized. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we may have Thee for our Father, that we may abide in thy Son and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Cecilia lived during the early part of the third century in Rome. There, she lived with her noble family, who in the past were known for their bravery and intelligence. They named their daughter Cecilia, which means Lily of Heaven. Her father and mother were both pagans, but they respected the Catholic faith and allowed their daughter to be raised a Catholic. Cecilia never missed a Mass, and she always kept God close to her heart. She grew, especially in the beautiful virtues of faith, hope, charity, humility, and purity. When she was still young, she made the vow of virginity. She wanted to be a spouse of Christ and belong totally to Jesus. But she could not join any convent, as the convents started only 200 years later. She loved the poor and they looked upon her as a dear friend who could always be trusted to help them in their needs. When she turned 18, her parents decided to get her married to a pagan. They chose a man named Valerian as her husband. Valerian was a good and upright man, and from the first sight of Cecilia, he knew he loved her. Cecilia was afraid. She had to do what her parents asked her to do. But how could she marry, since she had made a vow of virginity? She offered her heart and her sufferings to Jesus. She prayed and fasted, eating very little food. And the nearer her wedding day approached, the more she stormed heaven with her prayers and penances. She trusted that Jesus would somehow come to her aid and answer her prayers. One night, 
Jesus appeared to her in her vision and accepted her generous vow. He also told her that he will send her an angel to help her keep her vow. At last, the wedding day arrived, and Cecilia, in her finest dress of silk and gold, became a bride against the dearest wishes of her heart. When the wedding party was over, Cecilia found herself alone with her husband, Valerian. She then spoke in loving, gentle words to him. Valerian, there is a secret that I wish to tell you. I have a lover, an angel of God, who watches over me with jealous care. If you will allow me to keep my vow of virginity, this angel will love you as he loves me, and he will grant you many favors. I am very surprised at what you're telling me. I wish to see this angel. That only can be if you will believe in one God and be baptized. How shall I become so? She sent him to Pope S. Urban, who baptized him. After the baptism, when he returned, he couldn't believe his eyes. He saw Cecilia praying in her chamber, and there was an angel by her with flaming wings. The angel was holding two crowns of roses and lilies, and the whole room had a distinct fragrance. The angel placed the first crown on Cecilia's head, and then he slowly approached Valerian and placed the second crown on his head. Valerian was spellbound at this miracle, and he couldn't say a word. Thank you, Cecilia. You have opened my eyes to the one true God. Thank you so much. They lived together happily as faithful Christians. Valerian had a brother named Tiberius. When Tiberius heard the news of his brother's conversion to Christianity, he was furious. He rushed to his brother's house, and as soon as he entered the house, he wondered at the fragrance inside. When he heard the story of how they had obtained the crowns, he was curious, and he too consented to be baptized. After he was baptized, Tiberius too was able to see her special angel. Cecilia, along with two brothers, started preaching to people about Christianity. Being a Christian was really dangerous during those days, as you could get killed. Those who got killed for professing their faith were considered as martyrs. The two brothers devoted themselves to burying the martyrs slain daily by the prefect of the city, Tertius Almachius. In the meantime, St. Cecilia, by preaching, had converted 400 persons, whom Pope Urban baptized. Before long, the governor of Rome ordered arrest of Valerian and Tiberius, and they were brought before him. Valerian, your brother has become crazy with all those Christian ideas. I hope that you have not become this way too, and that you will be able to answer me sensibly. My brother is not crazy. We are only serving one true God. Don't speak to me about these foolish things. Speak with wisdom to me. You don't understand what I'm saying, because you don't want to hear the truth. The prefect was really angry, and he ordered the brothers to be beheaded. The two new Christians were soon executed for burying the bodies of those who had been martyred. Cecilia was heartbroken. She buried their bodies alone, with no one to help her. She realized her time on earth was ending soon. So she set about arranging her affairs. She started giving away all her possessions to the poor and needy. Soon, Cecilia was arrested and brought before the prefect. But she was not afraid. She was longing for martyrdom. I too am a Christian, and I believe in the one and only true God. The prefect was furious. Cecilia, 
You are condemned to die. When the sentence was passed, there was no sign of suffering nor fear on her face. They doomed her to be confined in her own baths, the splendid marble baths of the old Roman palaces, there to be burned by the most intense heat, kept up by the stoves below. Just as we read in scripture of the three youths who walked in the midst of the flaming furnace praising God, Cecilia walked through her baths unhurt by the fierce heat. Her hands extended in prayer, her voice rising in clear, soft hymns to heaven. Fresh fuel was added to the fires hour by hour. No man dared brave an entrance into those heated baths. And yet the words of praise came fresh and strong till evening faded into night. A whole day went by. Still Cecilia sang and prayed, and everyone gathered there heard and marveled that she did not die. When the prefect heard of this, he was very angry. She will have her head cut off with a sword. After the flames died, an executioner entered the house, carrying the sword. When he saw Cecilia sitting there and singing praises amongst the fire, he was surprised. Her cheeks were cool and fresh, as if the fire could do her no harm. The executioner had orders to carry out, so he lifted the sword and struck her thrice. It was a miracle. Cecilia still lived. Trembling with fright, the executioner ran away. Cecilia managed to live for three more days, during which she prayed and said goodbyes to everyone who came. On the third day, Pope Urban came and gave her his last blessing, and Cecilia was amongst the company of virgin martyrs in heaven. Saint Cecilia is the patroness of musicians and church music because as she was dying, she sang to God. She is one of seven women, excluding the Blessed Virgin, commemorated by name in the canon of the Mass. O glorious Saint Cecilia, Virgin and Martyr, you won the Martyr's Crown without renouncing your love for Jesus, the delight of your soul. We ask that you help us to be faithful in our love to Jesus, that in the communion of the saints, we may praise him twice in our song of rejoicing for the blood that he shed, which gave us the grace to accomplish his will on earth. Amen. Perpetua and Felicitas were two third-century Christian martyrs. Their story is told in the Passion of St. Perpetua, St. Felicitas, and their companions, and regarded as one of the great treasures of martyr literature, a document which is said to preserve the actual words of the martyrs and their friends. Vivia Perpetua was a well-educated young noblewoman of Carthage, a city in North Africa. Her mother was a devout Christian, and her father was a pagan. It is believed that she was a widow, for she also had an infant son. Perpetua was interested in learning more about Christianity, and her mother helped her to learn more about this religion. In the year 203, she decided to follow her mother's footsteps and become a Christian by faith. It was very dangerous being a Christian in those days as the evil Emperor Severus persecuted anyone who decided to follow this religion. Perpetua had a younger brother, and when he learned about his sister's interest in Christianity, he too decided to become a Christian. Her father, who was a pagan, was very angry at first. 
He punished her by locking her up in a room and starving her. When he realized that she was not going to be scared, he decided to reason with her. He tried to talk her out of her decision. Daughter, have you given any thought of what would happen to your son if something were to happen to you? Father, do you see this face here? Yes, I do. Could it be called by any other name than what it is? No. Well, so I, too, cannot be called anything other than what I am, a Christian. At this, her father was so angry that he quickly left the room. Perpetua was left alone for the next few days, and during this time, she got baptized. At the time of her baptism, she was told to pray for nothing but endurance in the face of her trials. She was known for her gift of the Lord's speech and receiving messages from God. A few days later, she was arrested and put in prison. I was terrified, as I had never before been in such a dark hole. What a difficult time it was. With the crowd, the heat was stifling. Then there was the extortion of the soldiers. And to crown all, I was tortured with worry for my baby there. Perpetua was arrested with four other catechumens, including two slaves, Felicity and Revocatus, and Saturninus and Secundulus. The young slave, Felicity, while being pregnant, was even worse off, for Felicity suffered the stifling heat, overcrowding, and rough handling by the soldiers. Despite threats of persecution and death, Perpetua, Felicity, and their companions refused to renounce their Christian faith. Then, Tertius and Pomponius, the blessed deacons who tried to take care of them, bribed the soldiers, allowing them to go to the better part of the prison. There, her mother and brother were able to visit Perpetua and bring her baby to her. Then I got permission for my baby to stay with me in prison. At once I recovered my health, relieved as I was of my worry and anxiety over the child. My prison had suddenly become a palace, so that I wanted to be there rather than anywhere else. One day, her brother told her to pray for a vision to show what's in store for her next. Perpetua, who spoke to the Lord often, told her brother she would tell him what happened the next day. That night, she received a vision while praying. I saw a ladder of tremendous height made of bronze, reaching all the way to the heavens. But it was so narrow that only one person could climb up at a time. To the sides of the ladder were attached all sorts of metal weapons. There were swords, spears, hooks, daggers, and spikes. So that if anyone tried to climb up carelessly or without paying attention, he would be injured. At the front of the ladder lay a dragon of enormous size, and it would attack those who tried to climb up. Satyrus was the first to go up. He arrived at the top of the staircase, and he looked back and said to me, Perpetua, Perpetua, I'm waiting for you. But take care. Do not let the dragon bite you. He will not harm me, I said. In the name of Christ Jesus. Slowly, as though he were afraid of me, the dragon stuck his head out from underneath the ladder. Then, using it as my first step, I trod on his head and went up. Then I saw a beautiful vast garden with a tall man with white hair dressed like a shepherd and milking sheep. And 
and standing around him were many thousands of people clad in white garments. And he raised his head, looked at me, and said, I am glad you have come, my child. He called over to him and gave me, and gave me a mouthful of milk. And all those who stood around said, Amen. Perpetua woke from her dream with a sweet taste still in her mouth. At once she told her brother what happened, and together they understood they must suffer during the times to come. Meanwhile, Felicity was also in torment. There was a law which forbade throwing even a Christian woman to the wild beasts if she was with child. Felicity was afraid that she would not give birth before the day set for their martyrdom, and her companions would go on their journey without her. Thanks to her prayers, two days before the execution, Felicity gave birth to a healthy girl. She was later adopted and raised by a family in Carthage. The officers of the prison began to recognize the power of the Christians and the strength and leadership of Perpetua and Felicity. In a few days, they were taken for a hearing to the governor, Hilarionis. Have pity on your infant son. Offer the sacrifice for the welfare of the emperors. I will not. Are you Christian? Yes, I am. How dare you? You and the others are condemned to be thrown to the wild beasts in the arena. That will teach you and all others who wish to follow your religion a lesson. The four new Christians and their teacher went to the arena with joy and calm. Perpetua and Felicity, in usual high spirits, met the eyes of everyone along the way. We are told she walked with shining steps as the true wife of Christ, the darling of God. Perpetua and Felicity were to face a maddened cow, also known as a heifer, as an insult to their womanhood and their maternity. Strangely enough, the audience, screaming for blood, though it was, yet was touched by the sight of these two, so young and so valiant, and the people shuddered. Perpetua called out to her brother and other Christians, Stand fast in the faith and love one another. Do not let our sufferings be a stumbling block to you. When the heifer failed to kill the brave women, the soldiers were ordered to strike them down. Felicitas was struck down first, then Perpetua, but only after the nervous swordsman had struck her once and failed to sever her head. The second time, she guided his sword with her own hands. It was as though so great a woman, feared as she was by the unclean spirit, could not be dispatched unless she herself were willing. Ah, most valiant and blessed martyrs, truly are you called and chosen for the glory of Christ Jesus our Lord. And any man who exalts honors, and worships his glory, should read for the consolation of the church these new deeds of heroism, which are no less significant than the tales of old. For these new manifestations of virtue will bear witness to one and the same Spirit who still operates, and to God the Father Almighty, to his Son Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom is splendor and immeasurable power for the ages. Amen. Dominic Savio is the youngest person that the Catholic Church has ever declared to be a saint on the basis of his heroic virtue alone, that is, his exceptional goodness. Dominic was the son of poor working-class folks. His father was a blacksmith, and both of his parents taught him about Jesus, Mary, and the saints, and how to pray. 
Dominic was a remarkable boy. Even as a young boy, he had great faith. For example, he said grace before every meal and refused to eat with those who did not. He was very bright and enjoyed school as well as play. He was well-liked and respected by his friends. He showed leadership skills from a young age and used those skills to encourage his friends to holiness. Although he was young, Dominic was clearly different than his peers. Once, two boys in his school stuffed a school heating stove with snow and rubbish. The boys were known troublemakers and were likely to face expulsion if caught, so they blamed Dominic for the misdeed. Dominic did not deny the accusation, and he was scolded before the class. However, a day later, the teacher learned the truth. He asked Dominic why he did not defend himself while being scolded for something he did not do. Dominic mentioned he was imitating Jesus, who remained silent when unjustly accused. Dominic attended church regularly with his mother. He even prayed outside the church building. It did not matter to Dominic if the ground was covered with mud or snow. He knelt and prayed anyway. While the children of the time customarily received their first communion in their early teens, Father Lucha recognized the boy's remarkable piety and let him make his first communion at the age of seven. As the day of his first communion drew near, Dominic wrote down four resolutions, remarkably mature thoughts of a seven-year-old. I will go to confession and communion as often as my confessor will allow. I will sanctify Sundays and holy days in a special way. Jesus and Mary will be my friends. Death, but not sin. As we shall see, Dominic lived by these resolutions. Once on the long three-mile walk to school, an elderly man asked him whether he was afraid to walk alone so far. Dominic cheerfully replied, Nothing seems tiresome or painful when you are working for a master who pays well. While full of energy and ready to join in any game with his friends, Dominic's health was weak. Dominic's teacher spoke well of him and brought him to the attention of Father John Bosco. Father John Bosco was renowned for looking after hundreds of boys, many of them orphaned and poor. In October 1854, Dominic was personally introduced to Father Bosco, along with his father. At the meeting, Bosco wanted to test Dominic's intelligence and his understanding of the Catholic faith. He gave the young boy a book, and asked him to learn a few pages by heart. He then asked the boy to come back the next day when he had memorized the text. Father Bosco sent Dominic off to join the other boys who were playing, and then he turned to have a word with his father. Mr. Savio assured him that Dominic was a very good boy and a bright student. To Father Bosco's surprise, Dominic returned a few minutes later. Smiling, he said, I can recite it now if you want me to, Father. Father Bosco listened as the boy recited the assigned page word for word without hesitation or any mistakes. With a little doubt in his voice, Father Bosco asked if he knew the meaning of what he had just recited. Eagerly, Dominic explained clearly the meaning of the passage to the delight of both Father Bosco and his father. Dominic was invited to attend the school he had recently founded. 
Oratory of St. Francis de Sales, a school, youth center, and hospice that Don Bosco had begun as part of his work with young boys. Dominic was excited too. He knew that if he was a good student, he could eventually become a priest and grow even closer to the Lord. The oratory became Dominic's home for the rest of his short life. Dominic deeply impressed Father Bosco with his desire to become a saint, so much so that the priest began to take notes about the exceptional young boy. These notes would later become the basis of a biography about Dominic. Father Bosco helped his young charge grow in holiness. At first, Dominic thought that being a saint meant being very serious and doing many penances for his sins. In his zeal, he tried voluntary mortification and other voluntary penances hoping that they would help him to grow closer to Jesus. Sometimes he skipped meals so that he would have more time to pray. The other students made fun of him. But Father Bosco taught him that the best way to be a saint is to do ordinary things every day with extraordinary zeal. He explained that what he should do instead was to devote himself to his studies and to be cheerful. He discouraged Dominic from any more physical penances. Dominic's happy demeanor quickly returned. At the same time Dominic was developing his reputation as a fantastic student, his health began to fail. Dominic was taken to the doctor, who recommended that he be sent home to his family to recover. Dominic wanted to stay at the oratory, but Father Bosco insisted he go home. Everybody expected Dominic to recover, except for Dominic himself, who insisted he was dying. He implored his parents to bring the parish priest so he could make a last confession. They obliged him, and Dominic made a confession and was given the anointing of the sick. His last words were, Goodbye, Dad, goodbye. What was it the parish priest suggested to me? I don't seem to remember. Oh, what wonderful things I see. Dominic fell asleep and died within minutes. It was March 9th, 1857 and Dominic was merely 14 years of age. Father Bosco was powerfully touched by Dominic, and he wrote a biography, The Life of Dominic Savio. The biography quickly became popular and would eventually be read in schools across Italy. Dominic Savio was declared venerable in 1933 by Pope Pius XI beatified in 1950, then canonized in 1954 by Pope Pius XII. Oh, Saint Dominic Savio, a model of purity, piety, penance, and apostolic zeal for youth. Grant that through your intercession, we may service God in our ordinary duties with fervent devotion and attain the grace of holy joy on earth, that we may one day love God forever in heaven. Amen. Saint Martha, the Lord's worker and servant, is only mentioned in three chapters of the Bible, but her character comes through clearly. We only know what we read about her in the Gospels of Luke and John. Whatever is said about her early life comes to us from apocryphal writings, which could be the work of somebody's imagination. We first meet her in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. The Lord was often a guest in her home, especially during the time of his preaching in Jerusalem. 
her sister Mary sat beside the Lord at his feet, listening to him speak. Hospitality is paramount in the Middle East, and Martha believed in its importance. So she quickly ran to the kitchen to serve her guests. Mary, in the meantime, ignored the hospitality and Martha in order to sit and listen to Jesus. She came out of the kitchen and said, Lord, my sister has left me alone to serve. Speak to her, therefore, and tell her to help me. Jesus' response is not unkind, which gives us an idea of his affection for her. He observes that Martha is worried about many things that distract her from really being present with him. He reminds her that there is only one thing that is truly important, listening to him. And that is what Mary has done. In Martha, we see ourselves worried and distracted by all we have to do in the world and forgetting to spend time with Jesus. It is, however, comforting to note that Jesus loved her just the same. The next visit shows how well Martha learned this lesson. When her brother Lazarus died, both Martha and her sister Mary were grief-stricken. When Martha was told that Jesus had arrived, she went out to meet him. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But I know that even now God will give you what you ask. Jesus told her that her brother shall rise again. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, although he be dead, shall live. And everyone that lives and believes in me shall not die forever. Do you believe this? Jesus asked. I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. He who is to come into the world. Jesus then raised their brother Lazarus from the dead. Martha's great faith in Jesus was thus rewarded. There's another story, this one from Province. Now keep in mind that this is a legend, but one with an interesting lesson to it. According to provincial tradition, after the ascension of our Lord, When the disciples departed, Martha, with her brother Lazarus and her sister Mary and many others, were put into a ship without sail, oars, or rudder. By the conduct of our Lord, they all came to Marseille, and after came to the territory of Aix in province. They began preaching the word of God to all the people in Aix. Martha was welcomed graciously by the townspeople, and they were very courteous to her. The people told her about a ferocious dragon living by the woods, half beast and half fish, who lurked in the river. Tarascon dragon, as it was commonly called, had a huge body covered with sharp horns. It was so powerful that it drowned the ships. The terrifying monster killed those who passed through its poisonous breath. The people of the town had lost their sons, daughters, and many of their neighbors to this monster, and they implored the saint for her help. At the behest of the people in the region, Martha went into the woods where the monster lived. To her shock, she found the Tarascon monster eating a man. The saint remained calm and prayed to God to help her. She then cast on him holy water and showed to him the cross. The monster was overcome by some power and it suddenly stood as still as a sheep. The saint then bound the dragon with her girdle. According to the legends, Martha and Mary lived out the rest of their days in Tarascon, 
and they were daily occupied in daily prayers and in fasting. They gathered together a great convent of sisters and built a fair church in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Martha's tomb is located in the crypt of the local collegiate church in Tarascon. To this day, she is venerated by Roman Catholics in Provence. Her feast day is July 29th. Because she took care of the hungry followers of Jesus, she is traditionally known as the patroness of housewives, waiters, waitresses, and cooks. Let us follow her example in caring for our homeless, poor, and needy among us. Let us pray also to her for the needs of the parish and for our own personal needs, material and spiritual. Oh, Saint Martha, teach me to offer the simple gifts of kindness and hospitality to others as you did to Jesus and others. Let my hands be open to God's word in my life. Bless and pray for all those who come to my door. Amen. The Church calls St. Constantine the equal of the apostles, and historians call him the Great. So was Constantine an ascetic? The answer would be no. Was he a brilliant theologian? No. Was his moral life exemplary? Not always by any means. Was he a miracle worker? No. Was he even a Christian? Not formally until he was finally baptized almost on his deathbed. So why does the church call him a saint? Let us learn that today. Constantine was the son of the Caesar Constantius Chlorus, who governed the lands of Gaul and Britain. His mother was Helen, an innkeeper's daughter, whom the emperor Constantius had married, then divorced for political reasons. She raised him in her hometown, in the region where he later would build his new imperial city. Constantine was raised to respect Christianity. His father did not persecute Christians in the lands he governed. At this time, the immense Roman Empire was divided into western and eastern halves, governed by two independent emperors and their co-rulers called Caesars. There was a time when Christians were persecuted throughout the Roman Empire by emperors in the East and West. Before Constantius died, he appointed his son by Helena, Constantine, to be the next king. As emperor, Constantine undertook strong financial, social, and military reforms to strengthen the empire. He restructured the government separating civil and military authorities. In the meantime, the pagan Maximian Galerius in the east and the fierce tyrant Maxentius in the west hated Constantine, and they plotted to overthrow and kill him. Constantine soon learned that Maximian and Maxentius had joined forces against him. He took his army and marched towards Italy. Constantine's small army battled against the mighty army of Maxentius and Maximian the next day. But it was clear by noon that Constantine would not be able to survive for a long time. His enemy was gaining grounds, and most of his soldiers were killed. Constantine looked around and saw death everywhere. He prayed to God, seeking help. As Constantine prayed, a brilliant cross appeared to him in the sky during the day, completely adorned with stars, and written on the cross were these words, By this sign, conquer. He realized this was a message from God. After the vision, he ordered that his banner be inscribed with the Holy Cross and the name of Jesus Christ. On the 28th of October, he attacked and mightily conquered Maxentius. Very soon, Maxentius drowned in the Tiber River while fleeing. The following day, 
Constantine entered Rome in triumph and was proclaimed the emperor. Constantine was now Augustus, sole emperor of the West, but he was not like other emperors. When he marched into Rome, he did not make the customary reprisals against the vanquished. More significantly, he boldly refused to make the customary sacrifices to the Roman gods. This was dangerously politically incorrect for the Roman elites who were chiefly pagan. Very soon, Constantine issued the famous Edict of Milan in the year 313 AD to halt the persecution of Christians. In 323, when he became the sole ruler of the entire Roman Empire, he extended the provisions of the Edict of Milan to the eastern half of the empire. After 300 years of persecution, Christians could finally practice their faith without fear. Christianity triumphed through its witness of martyrdom and love and proclamation of the good news of Christ. In 325, St. Constantine gathered all the bishops of the church for the first ecumenical council in Nicaea. This council helped defend the faith against false teachings, holding firm the church's teaching on Christ's divinity. Constantine was deeply convinced that only Christianity could unify the immense Roman Empire with its diverse people. He laid the foundations of a new capital on the ruins of Byzantium and named it after himself, Constantinople. Since the throne of the imperial rule was transferred from Rome, it was named New Rome. The inhabitants of its domain were called Romans, and it was considered the continuation of the Roman Empire. He supported the church in every way. He recalled Christian confessors from banishment, he built churches, and he showed concern for the clergy. As for his mother Helen, during her son's reign, she traveled to Jerusalem and found the Holy Cross on which our Lord was crucified. She commissioned churches to be built at Bethlehem to honor Christ's nativity. And in Jerusalem, the Church of the Resurrection the Anastasis, at the site of Christ's tomb. She was proclaimed Augusta. Her image was stamped upon golden coins, and two cities were named Helenopolis after her, in Bithynia and in Palestine. Having been thus glorified for her piety, she departed to the Lord, being about 80 years of age, according to some in the year 330 according to others in 336. After her death, her son Constantine went to Jerusalem for the dedication of the Anastasis, the Church of the Resurrection. The happiness of Christians were almost beyond belief. Constantine soon succumbed to the dreaded disease of leprosy. As a cure, the pagan priests and physician counseled him to bathe in the blood as practiced during those times. However, he rejected that. It is said that the apostle Peter and Paul appeared to him one night and told him to seek out Bishop Sylvester, who will cure him of this dreaded disease. Bishop Sylvester baptized Constantine, and he received the holy mysteries. In a few days, the disease of leprosy vanished from the emperor's body. It is said he abandoned his imperial garments and wore only his white baptismal robe for the rest of his life. Constantine continued in his active role in the welfare of the church. He died on the day of Pentecost in the year 337 and was buried in the church of the holy apostles. Constantine was not a saint in the usual sense. He was a politician with all the compromises that entails. But no saints begin as saints. They are ordinary people who become extraordinary. There is every evidence that Constantine became a devout Christian before he was done. 
Constantine ended the great persecution of the church, and through him, the Roman Empire became Christian. Hundreds of millions of people throughout the centuries could practice their faith only because of him. In that sense, Constantine is a miracle worker. His mother, St. Helen, set him on the right course, and that's why the church titles them both as equal to the apostles.